Hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you're listening to The Long Game Podcast. This episode is a part of our Kitchen Side series, where we pull back the curtain and show you the behind-the-scenes conversations, debates, strategies, and brainstorming sessions that we have at our agency. And if you are a fan, if you're listening to us rant on these Kitchen Sides, then I would imagine that you think this podcast is okay. So if you could do me a huge favor and help us out, help us grow the podcast by going to whichever podcast app you use, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening to this. And please give us a rating and a review. That will help us immensely. Okay, so this episode, we talked about a bunch of stuff. We also brought on as a special guest this time, in addition to the co-founders of the agency, we brought on our head of editorial, Sam Lund. And we talked about, specifically Sam talked about, he pulled back the curtain on the editorial processes and really emphasized the benefit of auditing processes and how that allows for scale and clarity and cross-team communication and really to just know what everybody's working on and how that actually builds motivation. So that was an important part. We also talked about uh, shiny object syndrome and how there is this constantly moving target where everybody seems to be uninterested in doing the things that are old or outdated, even if they work. We also tied that into this thing where we've seen this new trend of people talking about how uh, the email list is back. So it's now all about building your email list, which to me, you know, that was we were doing that 10 years ago. So it's it's kind of a, you know, time is a flat circle type thing. We talked about hard truths and leadership from a tweet from Pep Laya and talked about whether we agree or disagree with those certain takes, uh, which was pretty interesting. So anyway, wide range of conversation. Let's go. All right. Today, getting back to basics, I think is the theme today. I think what prompted by all these LinkedIn influencers talking about the right way to do things and all of a sudden everyone has their own definition of the right way to do things or well, what's going on here, Alex? <laughs> I don't know if it's necessarily getting back to basics, but um, the the thing that I've I've said this before these platforms are incentivized to basically raise up the most sensational takes and, and to incentivize creators, including ourselves, right? Like we do these kitchen sides and like, sometimes aren't like, do you, do you always have things that you want to talk about that are timely, that are like new, that are different than they were before? A lot of the things that we're no, doing are just things that we work on quietly like, in the I background. A hundred percent. Like we yeah. were forced to constantly come up with things that are novel, that stand out, that are jarring. So, of course, on LinkedIn and social platforms where a lot of us are getting our news nowadays, the things that stand out are things like, you know, SEO is dead, like, you, you, or maybe it's not dead, like, maybe they don't go that far, but it's like, it's an outdated playbook. You've got to also include all of these different things. And they'll say, like, uh, multimedia campaigns, interactive quizzes, and a case study. And, and, look, those are good, valid things, right? But just this premise that, like, what is outdated, what is old is outdated and is no longer effective is just just play, like total bullshit right and it's like yeah. the operators sitting in the background who aren't on linkedin are just quietly sitting there working using their outdated playbooks converting like gangbusters and not talking about it and it's just you know i, I think there's so much doing? noise <laughs> hmm. they see those posts and they're like meh let me just go back to doing what's working <laughs> they just move yeah. on with their lives i'm not even gonna comment yeah well yeah. here's the thing though like new plays are completely fine. But the fact that those posts are positioned as you should versus I tried and this worked for me, like some of those folks shout from the rooftops, but rooftops about these new plays or outdated playbooks. And they're not even speaking from experience. It's I don't think they actually do the things pull, themselves. Like, noise and engagement and have something new to say. Whereas if they came at it from like, Hey, I tried this new thing. Wasn't sure if it would work. It did. Cool. Here's a learning that might carry a little bit more weight and not be so like, you should, you should, you should. It is a weird moralistic thing sometimes. I think there's like this rightful, r righteous indignation sometimes. There's this tone that comes across as like, you know, this playbook that you have is is somehow morally inferior to like what I'm doing, which is very creative, very human focused, very like whatever. And I, I love, so we've, <laughs> I've jokingly referred to Jacob Rudnick as the SEO Chad because he comes in on the comments and he's like, yeah, you know, like I'll take my outdated playbook and I'll convert it 10%. Um, you can have your creative stuff. I don't know. Like it's, there's, there's some sense of like uh, one is better than the other. One is right or wrong. And I just, it's, it's 
I'm reading that tone into the post, of course, but it is like a very much you should. Like, why aren't you doing mm-hmm. this type of thing? I mean, on a meta level, it's the people posting those things are like marketers being marketers. I mean, as a marketer, you want to create the fear that like you want to make folks feel feel like they're doing things wrong or missing out on something or missing out the new playbook so that you are seen as authoritative or they want to trust you or follow what you have to do. And like in consumer marketing, like you want to make people feel like, oh, you'd look more beautiful if you had this product. You would feel more confident if you had this product or whatever. So it's, it is kind of going after that emotion of, oh, I'm missing out on something or is like, there's something I'm not doing I should be doing. And I don't know, it, I guess, are we just going to have to deal with folks calling out outdated playbooks and trying to shift everyone's attention to a new playbook? And just ignore it? Is that the advice for for marketers? Ignore other marketers? <laughs> I just wouldn't take things at face value. You know? Like, just because someone yeah. has an audience doesn't mean that they ha- like have authority. That's all I'm saying. It's it's easy to build an audience, and that's great. But I don't think everyone should should have as much of an audience as they do or as strong of a stage as they do. I think try not to get tilted, too. It's like a lot of the times, like, we've had clients that have, have come to us and they've actually worked with agencies before that compete with us and we look at their results and they're actually really good results like and you know that's we're speaking highly of our competitors but like you know they want to go do a bunch of new stuff just because they don't feel like this is interesting enough for them and it's like i don't know i feel like people get tilted and it's like if something's working whether it's interesting objectively to work on or not like just keep doing it because it's actually it's really hard in marketing to find something that works in my opinion like i'm, I'm a growth guy right like David, you're a growth guy. Like what you do, like you, you're you're trying to expand like this this very wide amount of options that you have in the beginning, and doing minimum viable tests to see what even works. And you'd be surprised at how many things you try out that fundamentally don't work at all. And it's like trying to find that one thing that actually works. It's like needle in a sta- haystack. So yeah, if you find it, like don't let other people yeah. tell you it's outdated. I just <laughs> I just did a I did a master class, which is just like a webinar, and the host was like, oh yeah, maybe you can share learnings about like stuff that worked for you. And I was like, well, like 90% of the things I did didn't work at HubSpot and the 10% that did probably don't apply to most people. <laughs> but here are the principles that got me there. And I just had to like couch yeah. a lot of my, a lot of how I spoke, which felt strange because I think a lot of folks are told, hey, this is the way to do things. Or like here are best practices. And I'm just like, hey, this was, this is what worked for us. It's probably not gonna work for you, but here's how we landed here. And maybe that process will help you get to that 10% that works for you. But that's not as very, it's not very catchy or sensational or gets people's attention. Mm, totally. Some of the basics you, you mentioned at the start, though, the basics go back to the basics thing. I did want to touch on that just real quick. Um, Cause we were saying before we started recording, like uh, wherever you go, there you are is like that, that meditation book title. And I was thinking, you know, where, wherever the industry goes, the email list is there as well. Um, one, one thing that I constantly hear about, uh, including from some of our you know good friends is like blogs are dead or SEO is dead. Um, the blogs is dead, is, dead. is very funny. Yeah. Websites are dead. Um, and like the, the thing is like, we, we've talked about some of the, like I, I wrote a blog post a year or two ago that was like blogging is losing power, uh, enter decentralized content marketing. Right. Cause I saw this trend of like multiple people within a company kind of developing their own platform which I still think as a general principle is useful. Um, you just have, especially for an agile team, you cover more ground uh, by incentivizing your team to actually go out and share. But that kind of got extrapolated and a ton of people who made it big on LinkedIn started talking about how blogging is dead and the website is dead and you should just be on LinkedIn, incentivizing your people to be creators on LinkedIn. And for a very short time, there was this arbitrage window where it worked really well. But that's the same thing that happens with almost every platform. I don't know if you all remember the early days of Facebook, like Facebook was the best place to build a platform. There was entire businesses, a lot of CPG. Sorry, what's that? It was like cents per click or like per, per email collected. Exactly. And and the organic reach was insane. And then they started to pull that back and they made you pay for reach. And the same thing is it's already happening on LinkedIn and it's going to happen more. So this short arbitrage window is closing. They got a whole bunch of marketers to use the platform to probably beef up their numbers, um, their monthly active users, weekly active users. But at the end of the day, it's a rented platform. 
So at the end of the day, if you're using LinkedIn as an arbitrage platform, look at it as that. It's going to be a short time horizon window. You still want to bring people probably to your website and definitely to an email list where you own that contact information. And then you can say whatever the hell you want. To, to John Henry's point, he wrote, he wrote a tweet about this, about how that's where the good information is. He's like, the more an influencer or publication grows, the more general and accessible it has to be to keep growing. So if you want the real alpha on the internet, you got to follow the folks that are so niche and esoteric that their content won't be algorithmic, algorithmically boosted. This is why I'm so bullish on newsletters continuing to be a major source of growth for B2B. They allow you to say what you want, however you want to say it, without having to fine tune your content for algorithms and engagement. But also the money's in the list. Like it's like that's at CXL, that was our whole strategy. We built an email list and that we, we never like I was never gold on like direct response conversions from the blog. We just built the email list and sold from there. So we're back in 2014. So I realized I realized we jumped straight into this and this is Sam's first pod recording with us. Sam, our managing editor. What's up, Sam? We kind of just jumped straight Hi. into the discussion. It feels like you've been on here before. Yeah. You don't need an introduction. Uh, you know, I think it's funny that Alex just said that was back in 2014, like it was a really long time ago. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit, man. <laughs> I was thinking this morning about way back in 2003 when I was uh, kicking off the career. Yeah, 2014. I, those were the, those were different times for sure. Email marketing was different, but it wasn't, was it? I mean, what's changed? Really? There was the exact same thing that's happening nowadays. People just forgot about it. You used to drive traffic right. through it, SEO or social, whatever the there. platform was. Yeah, it's always been there. It's, it's, people just forgot about it because it's boring. It's not yeah. fun. I do think the standard for email marketing has risen a ton just because it's so busy and people aren't as attuned to their inboxes as they used to be because there's so many more messaging channels. But I do think it's still as viable and folks that put a lot of attention and care into what they email and how they email it are the ones that win. Yeah. It has to be a message from someone you want to hear from mm -hmm. and, you know, as a brand or as a company, there's someone who has a point of view that you're willing to actually go into your inbox and click to open. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, um, and that's a consistent or at least a consistent enough point of view or range of points of view that, you know, you can go there and find something of value. Right. Like how many websites do you go to in a day that you go directly to just to see what there is to consume there, to read or to, Never. to review? Like a B2B B B software not website? A, not like, a business's no. website, a publisher <laughs> oh, yeah. site, maybe. Yeah, maybe the Atlantic. Right. <laughs> yeah, like I, I go to the ringer every day because I want to read Bill Simmons and his people's take on sports and whatnot and, and mm -hmm. entertainment, right? But yeah, 100%. It's like there's there's not a lot out there that you're going direct to. So how are you getting there? LinkedIn, I think, is definitely driving a lot of that interest. But mm -hmm. that is fascinating. Yeah. Your point on the ringer, by the way, and I don't know if I want to like divert us too far, but like this whole idea of like thinking like a media company, it kind of never resonated with me entirely because in the grand scheme of entertainment options, you've got Netflix, you've got the ringer, you've got the Atlantic, you, you've got all of these different people who are genuinely like own, like they're not trying to sell you a product that costs. Ten to a hundred thousand dollars a year, like a B two B software company is. So then, B two B software company that sells some, you know, CMS or something like that. They're like, we're going to think like a media company. It's like, good luck. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're probably not going to get people that's right, like, you know, typing in your website every day just to see what you're thinking. But you might get them on an email list. So, what's interesting about the whole media company thing is there have been companies doing this for a while. Like Mailchimp has a series of documentaries. I remember seeing that back in 2017, 2018. I was like, that's really cool. Maybe I should watch some, but I never did. And I wonder if it's marketers marketing this idea of a new marketing strategy to other marketers who are getting excited about the shiny thing, mm -hmm. but then no one's actually consuming the content really much. Mm -hmm. Like I watched, I looked at MailChimp's YouTube the other day and they have like a couple hundred views on those videos. I'm like, wait, are these just marketers watching these videos? Cause they're curious what MailChimp is doing and wanting to copy their strategy. And then they go create a documentary series. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just maybe going in circles now, but that's sort of like a weird bubble that I wonder, I wonder if that bubble exists. Well, I, if you're, I think it does. Oh, go ahead, Ali. Yeah. Cause if you think about like a typical B2B SaaS audience, it's, it's other business people, likely marketers or folks that need to utilize those tools as an end user. And it becomes this like, <laughs> 
pyramid scheme of sorts <laughs> where everyone's just like consuming each other's content and it might do the trick right it might convert but it kind of exists in this own little bubble and it's a very expensive bubble i mean sam was in video production he knows that's pretty mm -hmm. expensive for 100 couple hundred views oh my god yeah yeah we were definitely we were definitely towing this line between e-commerce and and dipping into media and branded you know efforts at at sponsoring athletes and sponsoring trips and things of that nature they were on brand so it allowed us to kind of spread into media but the cost i mean as soon as we built the video studio i think six months later we were starting to reduce right and so it, it hits you in the face pretty hard even when you predict the costs as soon as it starts to roll in and you know, um, it's just it's hard to keep up, you know. I just think it's it's like, what category are you competing in, too? Because, like, if you're thinking about your typical 10 search results page in SEO, which might change, um, you're competing against 10 other sites who might be similar to you. They might be affiliates. But, like, generally speaking, it's, like, 10 other people, maybe 20. Like, there's not that many people who can compete with you, depending on, like, what you're, you know, what keywords you're going for. And maybe, you know, like a business podcast or like a course or something like that, you might have actually a pretty narrow competitor landscape as well. But when you start to think about like, we're doing this, we're, we're doing lifestyle content as like a B2B SaaS brand. Now you're competing with, so that MailChimp documentary, right? You're competing with that Conor McGregor documentary on Netflix. Mm -hmm. So when David, when David Lee Kim that. at the end of work every day, draws his bubble bath, puts his lavender petals in. <laughs> <laughs> Are you spying on me? <laughs> and, gets, and gets ready to wind down for a night. <laughs> Clicks on his TV. Riesling with an ice cube. His, what am I watching? <laughs> what is he watching? I was just thinking about that. Like John how much, Wick. <laughs> John Wick how for much, sure. Like, the audience like differs. Because like I know we're pretty different because we're growing a business. So I personally read a lot about ways to do my job better, even off, off hours. Right. And I can't speak for everybody, but I think the average B2B marketer, B2B worker probably wants to unplug at the end of the day, probably wants to like entertain themselves with something not related to what they do day in and day out. Right. And for that reason, I got, just like you said, he probably in his bathtub wouldn't opt for something that he's already doing eight hours a day. Right. Probably <laughs> wants to watch something to unplug and unwind. That's why also, like, I, I don't know if this is also a diversion, but like sometimes people get a, a little, I don't know, they get a little willy nilly with the term value and quality and content. Like, I, I feel like some people mean it in B2B, like a lot of people kind of poo poo the idea of B2B content as if it's boring. But I think like it should just be useful. Like it doesn't like some people think it has to be like entertaining and like over the top and like it's filled with personality. And like sometimes that is a thing, right? Like. I think Unbounce used to do that really well back in the day. They would write kind of boring topics around landing page optimization, but Ollie Gardner had such a great writing style and it was so over the top that he made it fucking intriguing to to listen to or, or you know, Rand Fishkin's like whiteboard Fridays. Like there was a lot of personality in those, but like sometimes it's like what what value means is so dependent on who you're trying to serve that sometimes I think like I sometimes boring content's fine and valuable to me. I don't know. Yeah. That's all I'm trying to say. Well, it's interesting you say whiteboard Fridays because like that was pretty rudimentary. It was him and a whiteboard and a, a camera. He could have made that a whole thing and he didn't because he didn't have to. Like it was still super valuable and actionable, but just enough of entertainment to keep folks hooked and to create a culture around it. So I think that's the threshold some people fail to find. Like I need to go all in in order to build that community and that culture. And maybe now, because Whiteboard Fridays was what, like six, seven years, like a well, while ago. Now it's like noisier, louder. There's more shit everywhere. So maybe you do have to go a few more steps to make it something to stick to stick with people. But I don't know if you need to do the full Netflix-esque type videos. Yeah. I think like my take on the whole quality thing is quality is very subjective and like the way I view it is maybe people are using the word quality as the opposition to say like the generic software comparison content where you get to the end and you're like, I didn't learn anything new from this. And they just didn't even make a recommendation of what's actually better to use. And after going through like five or six of those, I'm like, let me just go to Reddit and see what they have to say. Cause someone's going to mm -hmm. have strong opinions that mm -hmm. will actually help me make a decision. I think that might be what people are trying to fight against. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's my assumption. That's what I hate seeing online. And I'm like, I wish this was more helpful. And I wish someone would speak with first person experience than probably someone who just 
scraped the first pages of Google and rewrote yeah, it. Yeah, man, wasting people's time is not a good way to get on their, you know, good side. Like, we don't have time. If I'm trying to find an answer or get closer to an answer to something and you have content that somehow ranks just because you have the right SEO, blah, 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 but there's nothing, there's no there there, I'm never coming back, right? Like, you've, you don't waste, people don't have the time to waste, right? And so the value is furthering my own journey to what I'm trying to find today, right? Have you helped me along that journey or are you a roadblock? Mm-hmm. Right. And that's yeah. something a behavior I've noticed myself doing actually recently related to that, Sam, is when I notice that an article is really unhelpful or just written in a way where I'm like, I don't know if this is, this con- website has anything of substance. I'll actually click to other articles and confirm or like validate or invalidate that. And I'm like, hmm. usually right that they're just kind of farming a bunch of content. I'm like, OK, if I see this website come up again, I'm just not going to click on it, Oh, um, interesting. which I don't I didn't realize I did that until this conversation. Like. I actually know a couple sites where I'm like, yeah, I don't trust that site. Yeah. Like one example is say neilpatel.com. <laughs> no hate on Neil Patel, but I don't trust his, I don't trust the content on there. Yeah. Well, he plagiarizes people. I like so his a little bit of hate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Like, that's they, like they rank, pretty right? fucking unethical. So they rank. <laughs> they they rank, but I don't trust them. Like that's kind of the weird thing there. Yeah. yeah. It's funny that you use the word substance because I think truly when it comes to what we do, that that's the best measure of quality. Uh, it always, when we talk about quality and content, it always reminds me of Paul Graham's blog because it's like the most rudimentary HTML based blog and he has the best stuff and it's oh inconsistently God, yeah. formatted and it, it doesn't even matter. Like I know it's good substance, uh, but when it comes to our work, I know Sam and I, we've talked extensively about quality, both in terms of client experience and then deliverables. I, I think ultimately it does, it is subjective to what the, how the client defines it. And so you have to modify in that way. But if you're focused on your own business's quality, your own business's content quality, I think substance trumps anything else. I think the word is not subjective. I think quality is often used subjectively, but I think the word is more, it's variable. There's no universal mm, definition yeah. of quality. That's a better way. Because some, like, I used, to, when I worked at CXL, PEP's quality standards were basically, and this is a vision, it's not like something you can actually achieve, but every blog post we wrote had to be the best blog post on that subject in the world. The goal was that they would never have to read another thing on that article ever again. And then I joined HubSpot, and that wasn't the, the quality standard, and HubSpot served tons of people. There's HubSpot fans everywhere, you know, like they have a rabid fan base. And then I started doing it for my own personal site, and I used to write CXL style stuff that was 5,000 words, backed by research, backed by personal experience. It was like, took me months to write these blog posts. And a couple of people liked them. Like, they were definitely, like, they had their fans. Like, there was definitely, like, my nerds, you know? Like, I, I got a little email list with that. But um, I wanted to build uh, affiliate income. And turns out people don't give a shit. Like, they really do just want, like, quick answers for software. And to, to your point, Sam, on wasting time, like that, that is something too, like even in that, that style of content, which again, there's no, there's no style of content that's bad. Like a product listicle is not inherently bad, but what I would do in those is I would just chop out all the fluff. I'd be like, here's the stuff I recommend. Here's why, here's who it's for. And I would get to the point and I actually used all the tools. So that helped too. Like I wasn't just bullshitting. Um, but all of those standards were so different. Like I think, I personally think this is going to come back to bite me, but the stuff I write on my personal site right now is shitty. Like it's not good content in my opinion. <laughs> I don't know why people read it, but they do. <laughs> so, so I'm just saying it's, it's, there is a, an objective or that you can get towards an objective uh, quality standard, but it's not the same for all audiences. Is that going to be a snippet that you post on your LinkedIn? <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been pretty open so- with that. <laughs> I always talk about how I write shitty affiliate listicles now. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because we may not read that content, but people are finding it helpful and people mm-hmm. are the, following those links and then going on to purchase those products as we see from like your affiliate revenue, Alex. Like We see that with some client content where maybe our client themselves would not read the content and maybe we wouldn't, but it's helping someone and it's getting people to start using our client's products. So there's something to be said around hey, maybe it's not like whatever this mystical quality measure is, but apparently it's helpful and it's getting people to to use the product. You know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about the goal (laughs) B2B. I'm thinking about now, sorry, this um, like uh, content marketers are like this, 
like super obscure like indie jazz band and they're just like shaking their fists at the sky like angry that Nickelback has any fans at all. <laughs> they're like Nickelback people don't is not people that don't bad. understand the real quality. <laughs> I it's don't like, mind a Nickelback feel, song every now and then. But they're like they just hate the mainstream. You know, it's like they're, they're like they're the like hipsters. Like content marketers are like so in the fucking know that um, they don't understand that most of the world doesn't really care about that key change and like these nuanced things that like we all care about. You know. But the music the hipsters are creating is really pretty damn good. I like it. But I think there's, I'm a there's fan. Definitely value there. Yeah, I'm a fan. I'm a different different sort of person though. I'm not you know everybody. Pushing a culture. Yeah. So, all right, where do you want to go from here? We, we had some other stuff. Before this, Sam, you were talking about... I, I'm kind of wrapping it up in, like, remote team culture and collaboration, but you had this talking point around, like, process maps and the importance of using these as tools for, like, working together, especially in a remote culture so where, where did you want to go with that i mean i think going back to the basics of you know um process mapping is really just an effort to to truly understand like how work gets done between two stages right so say like a strategy session or for editorial from when something is an idea to when it's published um and it seems super simple right it's, it's definitely a foundational sort of documentation to understand for anyone Anyone, anywhere in the company to understand how things happen. But I think the side effects of these seemingly simple exercises, as you start to paint the picture of this is what another department does, um, your yeah, question you like, as an outside, what, what someone prompted? outside, what's that? Can you share maybe what prompted like the process mapping? Like maybe sure. Like and so, had? yeah, I think so. We have um, a strategy team and an editorial team who, you know, collaborate a ton. Um, but also have independent, you know, workflows. And so I think what prompted strategy was um, to to define their process to sort of then link up with the editorial process, which we defined over the last year, um, which really allows us to, to in, internally understand what's happening, but also to give our clients access to what we're doing and total view of everything that's happening as it's happening, um, which is, from what I've heard, fairly unique for clients. Um, so that then prompted strategy to do the same, to start that exercise of looking at how do we actually do work? And there's so much that comes from this, um, just a blatant honesty to start with, to actually say like, this is what it takes to actually create a document. I think, you know, looking at even just like, what does it actually take to write and edit an article and work with a client and really get all the information we need in there. It's a lot more complicated than we think it is. Um, but then that that allows everyone on the team. It sort of it takes your org and it flattens it down, right? And so everyone is considered, you know, sort of in these process of outlining process. It's just equal, like what what things happen, not who does the things, so that you can then objectively challenge why things happen. Hmm. Why are we doing these things this way? And then the team starts to talk about their function within that system. They start to see their role in the system. They start to see how it affects downstream and how they're affected by upstream decisions. How does sales affect strategy? How does strategy affect editorial? What key documents then can we start to look at and really objectively tear apart and make sure they're doing their best work? Um, and these conversations just continue to cascade down until you know we, we're we're really looking at everything we do and saying you know is that the best version of what we what we you know want that to be. Um, and then you can set in process continuous improvement and say, okay, now we've kind of set up a baseline. We can come back to this once in a while and sort of just sort of gut check and maintain our process, which allows us to be efficient, which allows more space for creative work to happen, right? Instead of writers being stressed about deadlines, we've created efficiencies to give them a little more time to do a little more research. And then that quality we were talking about becomes more enabled but without, with less pressure on the individual, not more, right? So there's all these benefits that start to bubble up from something as simple as saying, what do we do, <laughs> right? What does each one of us do to make something happen? So, you know, and that's, it, it is really basic, but I think I've certainly worked at, most of the companies I've worked at don't have these documents or have some very old dusty rendition. Um, and so it's, I think it's just something that's important to remember when there's a lot of chaos and noise up here, there's a lot of stability keeping us grounded um, that we can focus on, right? 
Yeah, there's also that idea that we've talked about in the past uh, from Benjamin Elias around process. Um, and he talks about how oftentimes processes get built up but never audited. So it's like you end up with like archaic systems, bloated systems, and then areas mm -hmm. where you actually do need more process and you've, you haven't identified that gap. So I feel like you're doing an audit where you can kind of visualize all of those things to actually like strip it down on this part. This is, this is overcomplicated or add it up here because there's confusion and quality control is necessary. And because everyone knows how it works, they now know when something's wrong a little bit easier too, when something's amiss, mm -hmm. because it's not just kind of a mystery thing that something happens, you know, work falls on your desk and you do it and then it goes off down a tube somewhere and you never see it again. It's like, we understand how everything's actually affecting everything else. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a holistic, you know, kind of ecosystem at that, at that point. Right now, how hard is that as you scale? Like we're a small company right now. Now 10 X us, are we, what are we talking about here? So, I mean, at that country, that's where I got my lean training and we were, how big were we at that point? We were a hundred million, $120 million company. We were pretty big. Our content team was probably 60 people. You know, the corporate team was hundreds. I think there were a couple thousand total employees. It was big. And so to map that process out, took a group of 60 people being in a room. We got two rooms and put them, you know, had the room for the door in between opened up and sort of, it took all of us sitting there mapping this massive process across walls. Did you do it on note um, cards? How'd you do it? Uh, sticky notes and note sticky cards. Notes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I love it. then we were, I mean, through six months of doing various things, we were able to create 23% efficiency and unlock something like $20 million in inventory that was locked for three months historically year over year. So it scales. It's just a matter of its scale. You have to have, we had CEO buy-in, which means we got what we needed. If I need an engineer, I got an engineer. And so that kind of, that ability to actually fix the problems is where companies get stuck. You can outline them, but then you have to actually go in and, and commit to fixing them. And that can be costly mm. at first, but of course the efficiency is down the line. So it's, it, the culture of the company has to be bought in at the highest level. Um, and that was just the right environment at that scale. Cause I think it is a lot harder at scale just because yeah. of the cost. Time. So it seems like that's, I mean, obviously, you know, doing it at multiple stages iteratively before you reach that point is going to be functionally yeah. easier as a company, yeah. but then it yeah. becomes more important as you scale too. It's like the size of the impact is actually like far away. Like at this point, like there's probably some inefficiencies, but they're not like million dollar inefficiencies. Um, but ironing it out at this stage allows you to, you know, when you two X, five X, 10 X to not have it be this crazy arduous process at that point. hundred percent. It's saving also, you those millions later. I can also imagine too, it's good to build that habit of, of feeling comfortable, feeling a little bit stagnant and not always pushing forward despite not having a grip on your process. Cause I know some people are always so bullish on just like continue moving, continue growing. And some folks are like, ah, we probably should sit down and figure this out, nail this out quickly. So it's easier to do while you're smaller. So you build that habit as you grow and you install continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to be agile. Culture. 100%. Sorry, go ahead. You, you're still going to be agile. I mean, you can add to mm -hmm. and take away at any time. The mm -hmm. idea is just knowing what you're doing. It's knowing how all the parts work. It's knowing how the engine works and then mm -hmm. saying when something breaks, we all know where to go to fix it. And we all have ideas of, of what might go, what might need to happen to fix or even enhance, right? And change it. That seems like the critical component is like the actual, like it's like any sort, sort of research or audit process. Like if we do a tactical SEO audit for a client, give them a thousand things to fix and they don't actually do anything about it. It's like, you know, that work was kind of, they're aware of it now, which is something. Uh, but if they don't take action on it, it seems like that piece is important too, where it's like you audit the processes and then you actually have the capacity to like fix it where, where you need to fix it. And you stack rank it too. Like you might find 10 areas. It's like, yeah, these are all kind of messy. And you say, okay, well, which one can we actually fix easy and quick or which one's going to have the biggest bang for its effort. Right. Um, there's also a lot of patience required and understanding. And, and I think there's a lot of acceptance involved in nothing's perfect. And because nothing's perfect, it's okay to be constantly kind of tinkering and making things work better. Right. Yeah, I think it's, it's exactly. just for, for like, for the, for creative work, it definitely, um, I think there's resistance sometimes in, in creative departments to like the over organization or like too much structure. 
Um, but I think this is the kind of structure that, again, allows space for people to kind of think more and spend more time sort of going deeper into projects. This is like the mise en place that kind of goes about. into... The mise en place, yeah. That without, you know, Thomas Keller, without mise en place, he can't be creative, right? Um, you step up so, and cook. Yeah. You don't have to think about the ingredients. You don't have to think about the preparation. You've got everything set up. You just cook. It's go time. Yeah, do the work. Yeah, 100%. Maybe it kind of goes into the next topic about, like, leadership but sam how do you as a leader whether it be like with a team that reports to you or managing up to get folks to see like to do these sort of things where they sort of feel like hey that's too much time up front we should be doing these other things or like i don't want process i want to work on like i just want to get my work done like how do you as a leader like get folks on board to do this type of stuff um I suppose lead by example. Um, like, uh, I guess in terms of managing up, I suppose that it's in, in order for me to do my job, I have to understand how everything works. That's just maybe my personality type. I don't know. But also because I've done the work, like, so that's something that sort of I would have done anyway, sort of just as a, as a means of organizing my own thoughts and process. Um, but how do you get people bought in? I think it's, it's first of all, like folks need to understand that their buy-in is complete, that it's not, again, flattening out that org and saying, you know, that the purpose of all of this is to, to give everyone a voice and everyone an opportunity to have say in the work that they do every day. You know, that the core of, of all this process thinking is a philosophy of respect for people and respect for individuals. Um, within the process and the system. And so if you can get people bought into that, that this is really about all of us growing our own sort of roles within the company, but also um, our skill sets and adding to our toolboxes by moving through this sort of process management together. And then it enables folks to go on and grow their careers in, in management themselves, right? And it's like future thinking, um, you, you know, five years from now, these tools will come in handy, right? Um, but I think it's, that's the buy-in. It needs to be personal. It needs to be about how, how this relates to you and in, in the work that you do. You're not just another cog in some wheel, right? Um, I don't know. People tend to want to share their points of view if they're asked, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think that that's generally true. Um, so how do you make people feel comfortable sharing their points of view, right? Yeah. Yeah, Alex, you had this note on hard truths of leadership. I think you said from a tweet from Pep. Do you want to like yeah. pull that up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my when we were talking about substance and quality, one of my I, I thought about like the content that I like, and I like content that feels so honest that it feels almost vulnerable. Like it's almost like the shit that people talk about but never say. You know, they talk about privately. And I felt like Pep had a really good tweet today about um, I'm going to call them hard truths of leadership. And because they're not they're not like the fluffy business books kind. Um, he says, I've been an entrepreneur since 2007, been part of many teams before and after that. I've started five businesses and three of them are still kicking ass. Over time, certain truths about people hold true. So this I guess it's, it's leadership, but it's about people primarily. Um, first, people never do something only once. That weird outburst you witnessed or someone delivering a project way over time. It's going to happen again and again. Two, some people are slow and some people are fast. When you ask the slow people to be faster, they mostly cannot even. <laughs> Love that language. Three, A players have strong intrinsic motivation and they just want to kick ass. The mediocre folks just want endless kudos for everything. Four, if a new team member is not kicking ass in three months, they likely never will, but they can still be useful. What number am I on? Five? <laughs> he didn't number them, so I'm just looking at this list. Uh, drama kings and queens will bring a lot of social energy and love at first, but over time it will inevitably turn to poison. You have to get rid of them. And finally, if the leader, if you, the leader, don't actively manage the expected standards and pace, both will drop into gravity strong. Lead by example on both fronts. So, should we talk about if we agree and disagree with any of these? I love going down lists and just like getting our takes on individual items. Because I mostly agree, and I was I was reading through now, and there there's a couple counterpoints that I would probably make. Just go one by one. Okay, so the first one, people never do something only once. 
that weird outburst you witnessed for someone delivering way over a project, a project way over time, it's going to happen again and again. I, I think I, I understand the sentiment, but one time I don't think is enough data to make an executive decision. I would say two times and it probably won't happen twice. Only twice is the way I think about it. I think you want to look for patterns as I, well. Yeah. yeah. But if you see it two, three, four, five, six times, and then you think they'll still change or not do it again, I think that's that's not a good way of looking at it. Yeah, the, well, it the just doesn't seem like enough time. Enough times. What I took from it was that Don Draper quote that was like, uh, "People show you who they are, and we don't believe them because we want them to be who we want them to be." And I think that's the lesson that I took is that, you know, people are who or they are what they repeatedly do. And David and I have argued about this, but and I think actually we were pretty much on the same side now, but people do change, but it's very rare and it's never because you want them to, it's because they want to, and it's a long-term process and it's intrinsically motivated. So I think you have to meet people where they are and look at past actions and assume that that's probably the likely course for future actions as well. And I feel like this has been a hard lesson for me because I always see the best in people and I've definitely had it in personal relationships where you're like, oh, yeah, you know, <laughs> but you, you learn like those are tough lessons to learn. And I, I think I mostly agree with this point. Did David go? Are you waiting for me? No, other takes. Oh, on this point, I, I don't I think it's about patterns. Yeah, I don't I don't chalk up one situation and make a conclusion off that. That just sounds like irrat, like not reasonable. So I'll yeah, put it in patterns. I'll put it in a context of, of a classroom setting. If I judged every student I had based on one thing they did that was silly or downright stupid or kind of shitty, yeah. uh, I wouldn't have a lot of students I thought highly of. <laughs> so it's like, I think, but you know, they're younger and they're going through a lot of other stuff, blah, blah, blah. But I think just humans writ large, I don't know, I would say patterns, but I would say that I understand the wariness and the skepticism of once you did this thing, I'm going to be on the lookout for it happening again, for sure. You know, you trust. alert, yeah. Yeah. you know, I also think like in a work setting, it's like w after one or two times plus attempted feedback and mm. no change, that's like definitely a red flag because I, I also like, I'm personally growing a lot in this season of life. Like I'm fucking up a lot. And if y'all were like, eh, twice, you're done. It's like, wait, I'm trying. Like, I'm working on this. And I feel like in a work setting with teammates and going through really hard shit, there needs to be a chance to talk things through and give feedback as well. But in terms of, like, management employee or leadership employee, that dynamic might look a little bit different. But I do think feedback is an important element in this as well. That's the grand uh, uh, exception to all of this, I think, is that differentiation between the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And you can also pattern match for that, too. Like, that's the thing where you can see if they take feedback well, if they improve based on, like, their self-awareness and your feedback. Because you can test that pattern. Like, you can see, like, you obviously have a growth mindset. You've shown that through your life and career, right? But you can see when people don't necessarily have that, they've got more of that fixed mindset and they stay in that mm -hmm. static place. So I think that's the great, that's the great expectation or the great exception to this. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, next one. Dos. Yes. Some people are slow and some people are fast. When you ask the slow people to be faster, they mostly cannot even. <laughs> that just feels like an unfinished sentence. I think it means that like, like Gen Z style. I cannot even. Can't even. <laughs> I thought that was a millennial thing. Gen Z is Probably, a I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. This, this sounds like a millennial of, thing. It definitely it's sounds definitely like a millennial, millennial thing. Yeah. This reminds me of when I was at HubSpot and I was getting caught with a friend. And I forgot what prompted them to say this, but they're like, you know, if you worked at half the speed, you'd still be working much more quickly than most people. Mm -hmm. Like, not just that the company, but like in general. And I was like, oh, interesting. I'm not going to slow down, but it does. It's interesting that they would say that versus. Like maybe they wouldn't tell someone else to work faster because maybe, I don't know, that's not as kind to say, but <laughs> that, that has rung true for me a while. Like, oh yeah, I can slow down a little bit, but I'm not going to. I think it's a hundred percent true. Actually, I think this one's more true than the first one because I was also in that too fast and I got that feedback at HubSpot and actually it was, a, it was kind of painful for me to slow down. Like it didn't feel natural. And I've talked to many friends who had joined smaller startups after being at a big company and they're like, Dude, what I did on one day was what I did in six months at my previous company. And I don't necessarily think that one is better 
or worse. I think it's situational. So like at later stage companies, at public companies, like you don't, you shouldn't move probably that fast. Like there's a lot of risk incurred in doing so. But if you don't move that fast at a startup, you die. The only advantage you have as a startup is speed. So it's like, it's just, you know, what your, what your fit is. But I actually think that's, that's pretty true. Like in my experience. I think it's pretty true and it's maddening, but it's true. <laughs> it, it's definitely an area where, where one can practice their patience because mm-hmm. it's just not, you're not going to speed up certain folks for sure. The, the next point's interesting to me, like a players have strong intrinsic motivation. They just want to kick ass. The mediocre folk tend to want endless kudos for everything. Like, it, I don't want to believe it because I want to believe that people can be motivated and want to kick ass. But and it's almost like bucketing people to into either you have it or you don't. And I don't want to believe it, but I also don't know if I can speak to this from firsthand experience. And maybe I'm just like putting the blinders on. Dude, is this something y'all have witnessed? No, this might be the one that I disagree with the most. It's interesting that he, he creates a dichotomy between a player or intrinsic motivation and wanting kudos. Like ultimately you shouldn't always need kudos to keep moving forward. But like, I like kudos and I want kudos. That was my point is I, I think like I'm an a player kudos. and I like, I like kudos. <laughs> I think I'm, good. I'm super extrinsic motivated. Actually. I, I love extrinsic motivation, but you're also intrinsically motivated. Like both can like exist barely. at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we would be doing this as much and as hard as we're doing this if you weren't intrinsically motivated. I like validation. Kudos. Yeah, but like <laughs> I also think that some people need someone pushing them. They need yeah, someone yeah. making them go faster. They need someone holding them accountable, challenging them, keeping some they need someone else to keep their foot on the gas and they need someone to give them praise. And that's the yeah. only thing that moves them forward. I think that's so what I, he meant too. I agree and disagree. I would just re rephrase it really. I think that's what he meant. The, the phrasing around like, ha- like helping them put their foot in the gas or however you said that, like that was, that's the thing It's like yeah. people who are driven are self-driven. Like they, they definitely like there, there's David, like the amp it up metaphor. Like we talk about this a lot, the drivers versus passengers. Like you can tell when you're pulling someone along and you can tell when somebody's pulling you along and it's like, damn. Did you guys ever take driver's ed? Yeah. 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 When you I was have in to, high school, my yeah. Well, my parents hired this like company where they would come and like take me to school and like they had these special cars where the in the passenger seat they had their own pedals in case you like fucked up or they need to hit the brakes really. <laughs> I was like 15 years old. And that kind of makes me think of this is that you're kind of in the passenger seat like you're letting them drive. They have the wheel, but like just in case like you have access to the gas and the brake. And I think the B players or whatever are the people that don't ask that person to exit the car. They're like they don't say like I'm ready. Get out. I want to do this by myself. They're like yeah, you can just stay in case I, you know, whatever. It's like, that's the way they drive their career. And that, that's how I separate the two. I was thinking back to little 15 year old me. So this is a great analogy. As a dad, there were many moments that I <laughs> that wish I had should, one of those. You were like probably pedals. pushing on the floorboard. <laughs> <laughs> but no, my daughter is a fantastic driver, but uh, no, of course you have those moments. I've yeah. driven with some friends where I wish I had one of those. I'm like, Jesus. So oh, damn. I rode with David. I rode with David at that offsite and wish I had a brake pedal. <laughs> Diaz and I were in the back going, What is this dude doing? He's driving the Indian past here, right? Like, through the roads I, I took it much. I, I took it much easier on the way back to the air. Gunning that out. <laughs> oh my god, that was so funny. Um, we're at time, but maybe we can, we, um, let's just skip the next two. And speed, speed round. I want to do, well, yeah, we can do speed round, I guess. Uh, new, t- new team members not kicking ass in three months, likely never will. Yes. That's obvious. Like that's like common wisdom. I feel like, um, drama Kings and Queens bring a lot of social energy and love at first, but turns to poison inevitably get rid of them. I feel like that's also a classic relationship. Like yeah. when somebody's love bombing you, you're like, hold up. What are you doing? What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> it usually turns negative. Love bombing? What's love bombing? It's one usually a narcissist or somebody who, like a lot of avoidant personality people will do that. Uh, they come into a relationship and they're incredibly affectionate and uh, passionate and like over the top with their affection. Mm. And then usually they pull away. Or they gaslight you. Yeah. So it's usually a big red flag. Um, but the last one I found interesting 
If you, the leader, don't manage the expected standards and pace, both will drop and the gravity is strong. Lead by example on both fronts. Genu- like, cannot... I mean, that is... Yes, 100%. Yeah, I agree. And your word carries more weight than you would imagine. <laughs> Sometimes you say things that are half-baked ideas. It sounds legit to everybody, and you, you got to be real yeah. careful with, like, you know, the things you... <laughs> Well, I learned that confidently. from. That's why I appreciate like Darmesh at House Five. Like he was very intentional with the way he communicated. He'd be like, mm-hmm. "Hey, I have levels of the things I say. Let me first label what these are." It's like just a random idea that popped into my head. Never thought about it besides this. And you take it as you will, and don't like throw it away if you don't care, or like if it isn't helpful. And then there's like a, I'd like to see this, but up to you. And then there's a, this is a mandate. Like we have to move in this direction. And whenever he wrote a memo or whenever he did a presentation or something at all hands, he would always label it as like, this is just something that's been on my mind if anyone wants to run with it, but like, don't feel the need to, which I've kind of taken a heart whenever I communicate things now is like, just an idea. Don't, don't go do this if you don't think it's helpful. <laughs> Cause I have run to situations, not just like with building our business, but with leading teams in previous roles where I say something and then someone just ran, ran with it and spent a day working on it. I'm like, I didn't mean for this to happen. I'm sorry. <laughs> like I, we don't actually need this. Yeah. That's with the words, but like, there's also like this implicit thing with energy levels and like how much exposure you have to the battlefront. You know, didn't like people back in the day in wars, like before, like the, like the, the civil war and stuff, didn't generals actually like go to battle with everybody or like maybe before that front lines yeah like they would be on the front lines like i feel i think people detect hypocrisy in leadership now more than ever so it's like when you're trying to like you know squeeze all the juice out of out of a team and like you're sitting back like doing fuck all Mm -hmm. like that that doesn't work anymore and it never did for startups but like i think as a leader when you show yourself as like being on the front lines with everybody that's that's a powerful signal Sweet. I don't think it was the Civil War, Alex. I got to fact check you on that one. I'm thinking you're going all the way back to like Braveheart days. I was thinking those days. I think yeah, yeah. The, the like tribal leader was like the first person there to like <laughs> crush some skulls. I was but, actually uh, thinking of was... Harry Potter. I just watched the last movie, and <laughs> Harry's like, <laughs> "Oh, I forgot that war." <laughs> he's like in the war. He's like, <laughs> wait, he's like leading it. It's like he's like wait, slinging spells and shit. You? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my god. So we were thinking of yeah. totally different movie genres. All right. Is that it? That's the yes. pod. That's the pod. Nice to pod.